Hi everyone, this is Joshua Hoffman and welcome to another episode of the Masters in Marketing Agency podcast, where we deconstruct the why and how agency owners found their success and discuss a few things they learned along the way. Today I have Toby Danilchuk, the CEO of 39 Celsius, a full service digital agency implementing game changing digital strategies that produce more leads, more profits, and obviously more increased sales. Welcome, Toby. Thank you. Thanks. Happy to be here. So I am going to open up by asking what happens at 39 Celsius. Well, uh, like you said, not the company, the temperature. (laughs) What's that? Not the company, uh, the temperature. Oh, what is the temperature? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Oh, 39 is uh, 102. It's like a, you know, a bad fever. (laughs) Is Is that where it came from? No, actually, uh, because my undergrad was in biochemistry, I worked at a biotech company when I got out of college and I uh, manufactured viral proteins, but we used bacteria to produce those proteins and the bacteria would not produce those proteins until we shocked them at 39 degrees Celsius. So where is, I mean, I kind of see, but where is the tie, the direct tie then to like marketing and the agency and everything? Yeah, so we had we struggled with what we were going to call it, and I figured okay. that was a good good name to call it. Turn your marketing on at 39, 39 degrees. I do like it. Uh, I, I've had I've been responsible of naming one company, and it's not easy or fun. It's more of a yeah. headache. So, uh, <laughs> I think you did land on not only a good name, but I think it does have a. Now that it's I know a little it. less, it's a little esoteric, but um, you know. I like it. We, we were struggling for a name and that seemed to work and we just went with it. <laughs> sure, sure. And then I have to ask then, how did you go from chemistry and biochemistry to marketing? Um, so I started out of college working in a lab, uh, working on things like DNA modifying enzymes and protein purification, but I was not destined to be in the lab. It's a certain personality type. Wasn't for me. So then I moved into marketing and sales uh, at the biotech company. And then from there, I went back and did an MBA and launched out of that uh, a couple of years later to start my own company. Well, right after the MBA, I worked at a management consulting firm, then started a different business um, and then launched my agency. What was that business? Um, we were importing furniture and home decor out of Latin America. So we had started a retail business um, in a small suburb of San Diego. And um, this is in the early 2000s. And we did that for about eight years. Um, But we went from being a small little retail store to having national distribution on our products um, because back then, because this is an asset intensive business, all our money was tied up in the inventory of the store. We were pretty cash strapped. So we had to bootstrap a lot of our own marketing. And so I focused a lot on SEO in the early days. And before you knew it, you know, I'd built our own website. Um, and before you know it, we were ranking in positions one, two, or three for dozens and dozens of terms across all three of the search engines back then, Google, Bing, and Yahoo. So all of a sudden, we went from having these local customers in San Diego to now getting requests from all over the country. And well, then, then yeah, go, no, I was going to say, and then, and then um, the irony of the whole thing, so we really cut our teeth on marketing there. Um, And for a small, medium-sized business, you just don't learn those sorts of tactics in an MBA program. Um, But the irony in the whole story is that because we were doing so well online back then, our main furniture supplier um, said he was getting complaints from other retail stores around the country that we were stealing their business because we were doing so well. Um, and said we had to mark up our prices to some ridiculous amount. Uh, and I told him, if we do that, then you'll put us out of business. And he basically didn't really care. Um, so that kind of was around 2008, about the time when that recession hit. And between those two things, um, he that furniture supplier represented 60, 70% of our revenue. We just decided to fold it up. Um, 
and started our agency from there. So we took all that experience <clears throat> in uh, on the ground SEO, Google ads and everything else that we had been doing for eight years and rolled it into the agency and started applying that. Is there anything else that you took either from that business or the MBA that now you very actively use in your current business? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, an MBA kind of prepares you for more higher level strategy stuff, but tactically, you're not as well prepared. Maybe the programs have changed somewhat since since I was in there, but uh, you know, the th I think the most critical takeaways f from an MBA and applying it to uh, an agency had to do with the f financial and accounting understanding of business, um, understanding cash flow. Um, and so that allows us to speak the language of business with our clients that are more dialed in on cash flow and sales and leads and profit. Um, than just marketing stuff that they're not going to understand. So, but that, you know, the retail store, I mean, geez, we, when we started, like, you know, when you're that small and your money's tied up in inventory like that and you're bootstrapping, like you literally, like I had no experience in Photoshop. So I would literally go to the gym in the morning and I would sit there riding the bike and I would start reading this huge book on Photoshop. So I could design my own ads. I mean, it was literally like that. And I was reading books on HTML coding. Again, this is early 2000s. So, you know, things hadn't evolved as much. It wasn't as easy as it is now. But um, those are kind of the biggest things uh, that having that business I took into the agency was no, and, and when you own a brick and mortar business like that and cash flow is so critical to your survival, everything you do is mission critical. Everything you do has to produce a profit and has to generate results or you're, you're dying, you're consuming cash. So that made us able to relate to these business owners who had brick and mortar businesses who are trying to hit payroll, who can't afford to do foo-foo marketing. So we were very data driven and focused on how to produce cash flow um, for our clients. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that totally makes sense. Was uh, last question on this was uh, the MBA juice worth, worth the squeeze. Yeah. I loved it. I would do it again. Um, I enjoyed every minute of it. You know, a lot of it doesn't necessarily apply tactically on a small, medium sized business per se. Um okay. But yeah, no, I loved it. It was great. I had a great experience, met great people and yeah, I'd do it again. Yeah, we get, um, we obviously get a few people that have gotten their MBA and, and I tend to ask that question because you honestly get answers all across the board from no, I don't think it was useful at all to yes, it definitely was. And, and honestly, there's not even a uniform reason of why it is. Sometimes it's networking. Sometimes, like you said, it's more of the cash flow and understanding finances and everything like that. Um, so I will say after, you know, asking a bunch of people, I have not learned the answer of whether it's worth it or not. I will say that most people say, yes, they definitely got value out of it. So, uh, yeah. just a quick thought, um, yeah. taking a step back, do you mind just kind of telling us a little bit more about the, your company? Yeah. So we're a full service digital agency. So we focus a lot, however, on SEO content marketing, local SEO, um, we do a lot of Facebook and Instagram paid social ad strategies. Uh, we do a ton of Google ads as well. And then we integrate a lot of those strategies uh, across the channels as well. We do website design and building with a focus on conversion optimization, um, marketing automation, which allows us and our clients to scale more easily on the marketing. Um, and then in terms of industries and whatnot, it kind of runs the runs a pretty wide swath of companies from professional services like attorneys and doctors to hospitality, retail services in the beauty spa space, um, some e-commerce. Uh, we do quite a bit in restaurants. 
our clients are mostly domestic from coast to coast. Um, we do some work with franchises as well. So, Do you find the work is like relatively similar between industries or completely different or somewhere in the middle? Um, I mean, the work is the tactics are very similar. So, you know, once you have a really good understanding of how these platforms operate, um, how Google ads operates, how their algorithm works, how it's trying to deliver results, mm -hmm. those strategies apply, you know, the same to any industry. What changes is how you approach the strategy, how you write copy. So, you know, my, my approach is always any good strategy starts with the customer. So when we work with a client, we need to understand first, what are their goals and who is their customer or customers? What does that avatar look like? What are their needs? What are their wants? What sorts of things do they need to hear to become a customer? What sort of things inhibit the sale? And then we take that and translate it into a strategy. Um, where we're writing copy that's going to resonate with them. But the tactics under the hood in running a Google ad campaign and driving results are all similar for the most part. And I also want to go back to something you said earlier, uh, which is about marketing automation. And I guess I just want to kind of understand what tools you use. Is it internally built tools and software or using other tools? What does that look like, that landscape? Yeah, we started using marketing automation software about six years ago, and we started with a smaller company. Um, gosh, I can't even MindSpring or no, it was SharpSpring. And um, we just didn't like it. And then we migrated to what was formerly known as Infusionsoft, and, which is now Keep. And we're a certified partner with Keep. So that's the platform that we use. It's one of the original small, medium business marketing automation platforms. So that's the one we implement for clients. Um, and it's just really beneficial in terms of the features and benefits of what you can deliver um, from a marketing standpoint. What kind of data are you guys collecting? Well, it allows us to understand so that we're delivering the right content at the right time for somebody. So for example, maybe we create a lead magnet. Um, so on my side, I have a lead magnet for best practices for Google ads for restaurants. Somebody opts into that and we send it to them. And then as an example, uh, I'll send a follow-up email in two days if they haven't clicked on the link to download the PDF, the lead magnet. And I'll be, hey, you know, just checking in. I noticed you haven't downloaded it yet. Um, and so we'll have, you know, I might have three, four sequences there if they don't download it. Once they download it, they're pulled out of that sequence. And instead, now I'm checking in. I'm running a different sequence where I'm checking in on how they're doing with the best practices and implementing them. Have they started a campaign? And that slowly moves into, hey, if you haven't, you know, implemented these things, you know, book a meeting with me. We'll talk it through. Uh, I can help you and tell you exactly what you should be running. And then, you know, later pitch services or um, courses that we have as well. What are you using for that sequence? Are you using like Apollo or a different service? I, I assume not manual. No, that's right. Keep, the marketing automation. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So, so okay. we can, the nice thing about that software is that we can, tie our sequences into the customer's behavior, whether that's they clicked on a link and downloaded the PDF or not, or they went back to the website and visited a certain page. We can automate sequences based on their behaviors, like they didn't open an email, they did. Um, so it's, it's really cool. And I guess, you know, the biggest benefit is that you're not, you're delivering content to them at the right time uh, sure. for what they need. And then uh, going back to the inception of the business, uh, how did you guys get your first customer? Uh, that was just, we were hustling. Um, we went out and started networking. Like what literally, specific? huh? Specifically yeah. where? Oh, we were in Houston at the time. Um, and we went to a small business networking group. Um, Houston, I think it was Houston Networking News or something. Um, and I think they're still going. Uh, we bought a booth. We literally um, 
had no clients. We printed up business cards, had a website and just started networking and got a client there. And we, I think we picked up two or three clients there, some of which had, are still with us to this day over 10 plus years ago. Who is uh, we in that story? Oh, my, at the time it's my wife and I, so it was just us. Are you guys still running it together? Yes. Yeah. I'm at the office. She works from home, uh, part-time. So what, what's that like? We, we've also had a few, you know, significant others that, that work together. Maybe yeah. Positive, uh, uh, obviously, <laughs> but what is it, what is it like for you? Yeah, it's good. I mean, we've figured it out over the years. I mean, you know, she came out of corporate and was used to controlling things and, <laughs> you know, guiding and, and whatever. And I've never been a corporate person. So we obviously had to figure out how to align those personalities there. Um, And she finally just decided to, you know, take a niche role. um, And we figured out how to not overlap and bump heads. And, you know, we've been doing it now for what, uh, 14, 15 years. So we figured out a a rhythm there that works. (laughs) Yeah, I think uh, to your exact point, knowing what each person's strengths are and letting them run with it um, yeah. and not being too much in the way, but still being open to feedback and things like that, I think is, is yes. for all founders, maybe especially significant others. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good point. Very good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, I think the first customer and how you got your first customers is really important, but I always say that it's even the second customer that's even more important because that starts the trend. You could almost argue that's what really starts the company. Um, so you did mention maybe getting a few customers at that Houston event, but how did you get your customers after that event? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we had met with a web developer there as well, which was a good contact to have because at the time we weren't doing web development. We were doing SEO and Google ads and whatnot. So we kind of needed that partnership and it made sense, right? He's building a website, we'll do the marketing. And he introduced us to some of his clients, one of which was a franchise client retail uh, wellness space in Houston. And all of a sudden we worked our way in building that relationship. Uh, and it was like automatically we ended up with eight new clients because there were eight locations back then, which eventually it grew to 30 locations, which eventually grew to we were managing like 80 locations across the country eventually. So, um, you know, it all you never know when you meet somebody where that's going to lead. Um, and uh, and then, you know, that cascaded into some of these franchise owners who we had built relationships with, started other franchises. Um, and we ended up working with them and then, you know, word of mouth and whatnot. But so it was great, but working with franchises is um, you love them and you hate them. It's it, that can be a tough, a tough road to hoe. <laughs> you know, I'm digging into that. Uh, why and how? Well, because it's just they, you know, the franchisees want results, uh, which you're there to deliver. But then you have corporate hanging over, controlling the entire process, telling them what they can and can't do and kind of, you know, tying your hands together. Um, And on top of it, corporate has their own preferred vendors. um, which they want to use. So it can be a sticky situation from that standpoint. So you're, you're constantly kind of in this tug of war between corporate and the franchisee, your client is the franchisee. Mm -hmm. You don't want to piss off corporate because then they kick you to the curb. So it's just a very awkward situation. And it, it's just kind of dangerous for an agency. If that, if you have all your eggs in that basket, because literally overnight, corporate management can change. They can come in and be like, well, we have our preferred vendors. See ya. And boom, you just lost all your clients, like literally overnight. They can just say, you can no longer use that vendor. Um, so sad. See you later. Um, so it's uh, it's challenging. You have to be very careful, I guess, working with them because of that 
relationship. Now, you know, in defense of franchises, they don't want everybody going off and doing their own thing. I mean, it can get pretty crazy. These, you know, the franchisees will do all sorts of things that are off brand. So it makes sense, but it's just, you have to navigate that relationship carefully. It's, it's tough. It can be tough. I guess more red tape uh, to deal with. Yeah. Which is never fun. And it's corporate red tape, which might be the hardest. Um, yeah. So have you guys grown uh, since it was just you two? And what was that first hire? Yeah, we we started growing um, not too long after we picked up quite a few of those franchise clients. We started adding employees. That was back in Houston. And then we moved back to San Diego, where we're originally from. Um, and that's kind of when we started hiring people because we started picking up more and more franchise clients. Um, so that first hire was somebody straight out of college. Um, and we trained him. He worked for us for quite a few years and it was, you know, it's a great job for somebody like that because we're doing so many things and in terms of tactics and digital marketing and marketing strategy for these people. So they, they get a lot of good experience. Um, but then we grew to about, uh, six or eight people. Um, and then that was up to about just a couple of years ago and then COVID hit and everything went on pause and we had to let some people go. So have you made any bad hires? Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> many. One guy we hired, uh, came in and worked. I think he worked half a day, went to lunch and we never saw him again, but the first day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's, that's a new story. I, not, I have not heard that story yet. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> he went to lunch and we never saw him again. He's like, screw it. I'm out. Uh, oh. What do you think you'd be able to like identify then um, ahead of time? Maybe not specifically for him, but for any bad hire. Like, is there anything you've learned over the hiring process that you're like, all right, now I ask this in the interview or now I look for this or anything like that? I think the biggest thing is just so many of the people that we run across are just flaky um, when they're on the younger side. Hmm. So they seem to take, they seem to get sick on Fridays and Mondays, um, which is odd. I didn't know there was... Fridays and Mondays seem to be kind of sick days, but <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing too is they, you, you need to try to identify somebody that has a passion um, because we're very passionate about what we do. Um, and it's our client's business. I tell people like, look, imagine if this is your business, you mortgaged your house um, to get this off. Your house is on the line. You're you know, your, your financial well being is on the line. You need to be passionate about what we're doing. Our, you know, our clients put a lot of trust into what we're doing and we have to produce for them. So trying to identify people that have that passion and, um, can be reliable as the, because the reality is, unless you've been doing this type of digital marketing and you have a lot of experience, almost nobody can come in with the kind of experience that you need. Um, it's very hard to find that unless they've been doing it for 10 years plus. So I think passion is the most important thing. Uh, that, you know, okay. I was going to ask this earlier um, and I guess I'll bring it back, but you said your first hire was a, someone not straight out of college. And I guess I was wondering, you know, was that hard to therefore teach them? Was it actually easier because you could mold someone? Like, what was that experience like with someone so young? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's it was easier from the standpoint that they didn't have a bunch of bad habits. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't, um, you know, they weren't set in their ways about how to do SEO or Google ads. Like, I could train them on how we do it best practices. They didn't have any bad habits or um, anything. So it provides a level of flexibility that you can ramp somebody up exactly how you, you want them to operate. But is there, is there a but somewhere in there? Uh, well, yeah, I guess sometimes they're still a little wet behind the ears, as they say. <laughs> so, but 
but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think maybe it's, it's a lot on the manager. Um, and if they're willing to take that on and if they're comfortable taking that on and everything. Um, yeah. As we come close to the end, I just have a few questions that I tend to ask. So if you had to teach something to other marketers, what would it be? Uh, well, I think, first of all, don't build your house on rented land. Um, so I see a lot of agencies or other people that are single agency, single person agency that operate in a single channel. And then that channel will change eventually. So, for example, I've seen people that just uh, built their entire business on Facebook ads. And, yeah. you know, Facebook has kind of gone south a little bit. It's still an amazing platform for marketing. So I don't think there's much that has been taken away from it. But I can see those people that aren't diversified outside of that. Uh, things are going to change in this industry. And so you have to build content, own your site, own your build an email list. You own that. It can't be taken away. The algorithm in Facebook can change tomorrow and all of a sudden it's more expensive to advertise or maybe they just banned your ad account altogether. Who knows? But you own an email list. Um, you own your own content. And that is the biggest asset, I think, that you know you can develop along with those relationships um, to make yourself successful as an agency. Yeah, that was a that was a great response. Um, any books or podcast recommendations? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, books. Any? I focus a lot on. Go ahead. What were you I was saying? just going to say, sorry. It can be business, marketing. Doesn't have to be. It could be fiction. Anything you want. Uh, yeah, I mean, I spend most of my time reading uh, business, but you know, for me, like, there's two core concepts in digital marketing, which you got to have. One is the technical expertise. Like you have to know how to implement, get a pixel on a site and make sure it renders well on mobile. And so that's, those are technical skills. But to be really good at digital marketing, you have to have that combined with direct response marketing copy. Like you have to know how to write copy that's going to resonate with people. So to the books, Eugene Schwartz, um, one of the fa most famous ad men in terms of uh, copy and strategy, uh, learning how to write copy uh, is fantastic. And anything Gary Halbert, the Boron Letters, and he's got other books out there as well about how to write copy. Um, anything where you can write better copy that makes people hungry for what you have, uh, the better off you'll be. So anything those, those books around that, yeah. Anything non-marketing? No, not really. <laughs> I'm kind of narrow that way. <laughs> no, no, that's great. And uh, are you guys looking to hire any positions right now? Yeah, we're getting close to hiring uh, some junior digital analysts. So, um, yep. So we're looking to hire at least two two people right now. Perfect. And as we come up to the end of the episode, I just want to really give you an opportunity to tell people how they can find you and anything else you'd like to end with. Sure. You can visit our website, which is 39celsius.com, um, 39celsius.com, or you can email me at toby, T-O-B-Y, at 39celsius.com. We're in the Temecula area, which is just north of San Diego, between San Diego and Los Angeles. So if you're in the area, you can stop by our office uh, there as well. But um, in our phone number, is 951-444-0174 if you want to call. Happy to speak to anybody about digital marketing. Awesome. Yeah, really appreciate you coming on the call or on the show. Um, and for those of you who learned something new from this episode, please consider giving us a like or a follow um, so we can obviously continue getting the highest quality of guests. But as always, thank you for listening and enjoy the day. Thank you, Toby. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Masters in Marketing Agency podcast. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I just want to thank our sponsors, DevNoodle. DevNoodle provides marketing agencies with the ability to offer their clients unlimited website design, build, and management services with fixed monthly plans. If website design, development, and maintenance is holding your agency back from growing, 
please reach out to us at devnoodle.com, where we make websites easy, easy for you and easy for your clients, devnoodle.com.